Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Sayuri Romay. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of Programs at the Marine and Mike Mansfield Foundation in Washington, D.C. And it's uh, my pleasure today to be chairing this panel on Japan's new security strategy. As you know, the, as you may know, the Kishida cabinet, okay, great. Uh, as you may know, the Kishida cabinet had been preparing the changes in its security strategy since it came into power in October 2021. But the three new documents uh, released by the government of Japan in December 2022 uh, definitely reflect the tumultuous uh, year that we just had with the mounting um, North Korean provocations, uh, Beijing's uh, military buildup, of course, and uh, Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine. Um, now, to help, us, to, to help us understand how Japan has responded to these recent events through some important changes uh, in its security strategy, we're joined today by two wonderful panelists. Professor Hideshi Tokuchi, President of the Research Institute for Peace and Security, RIPS, in Tokyo, and Professor Kent Calder, Director of the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies at Johns Hopkins University, SAIS. I'm sure neither of them needs much of an introduction, but as they're celebrities in our field, but let me give a few of their uh, careers highlights. Um, Professor Tokuchi has been uh, president of RIPS since 2021, and prior to that, he had a long career in the Japanese government. He was at the Defense Agency, which then turned into the Ministry of Defense. Um, as a civilian, and he had some um, senior assignments before he retired, um, including uh, most recently Japan's, being Japan's uh, first ever Vice Minister of Defense for International Affairs. So welcome, Tokuchi-san. And as for Professor Calder, uh, before directing the Reischauer Center, he held several positions at SAIS uh, in the past few years, and prior to that, he served as special uh, advisor to the U.S. ambassador uh, to Japan. He was the J Japan chair at CSIS, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, he was at Princeton, Harvard, and um, he served as the first executive director of Harvard University's program on U.S.-Japan relations. So welcome. So we're very lucky to have these two experts who will be walking us through these decisive uh, changes in Japan's security and defense strategy. Now, without further ado, I'd like to jump right into the topic. I'll go first to Tokuchi-san, and then we'll, we can follow up with uh, uh, Kent. Um, so what are the major changes that are included uh, in these um, uh, new documents and in this new strategy, and how would you characterize them? Tokuchi-san, uh, and then Kent, 20-ish minutes. Uh, each. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Cyrus san for the uh, kind introduction. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's mine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can you? This uh, yes. Okay. 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 Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the uh, European University Institute for having me in this very important and interesting event. And my special thanks go to particularly, you know, to my friend and, and my mentor, uh, Professor Ken Endo, and and also um, uh, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Giulio uh, Paglise. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to touch upon. Uh, the uh, s uh, several things, uh, just in brief. Uh, first, uh, shift of the international security environment uh, surrounding Japan, and second, some points of the new uh, national security strategy of Japan, and finally, uh, challenges uh, for the future of Japan in security terms. Um, the, uh, the government uh, of Japan released its new uh, national security strategy uh, together, together with the uh, national defense strategy and defense build-up program on December 16th uh, last year. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, documents are usually called uh, three uh, national security documents as one set. 
Um, the national security strategy explains that the fundamental principles of the Japanese uh, national security are maintained, uh, but that uh, the strategic guidance and policies under the strategy will dramatically transform Japan's national security policy from the aspect of its uh, implementation. Uh, there are uh, some ambitious projects in it, but in my view, uh, the uh, orientation of uh, Japan's policy is not fundamentally changed. Uh, but the uh, speed of the Japan Japanese efforts has become much faster and, uh, than before due to the aggravation of the security environment. It is not a revolution, but an evolution. Uh, of course, uh, it's a giant leap, though. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, to begin with the uh, security environment. Yeah. Well... Uh, Japan started the uh, process of renewal of the security strategy before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It started mainly as a response to the uh, intensified US-China rivalry as Japan is... Uh... Oh, really? Really? Okay, okay, okay. I'll wait. Well, um... You know, as I said, uh, Japan started the process of the renewal of the strategy before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, the Russian invasion of Ukraine became a uh, you know, big wake-up call for the Japanese. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, often said that uh, Ukraine today might be Asia tomorrow. Uh, also, um, Okay. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> you know, alliances and international partnerships uh, proved to be critically important. Economic security uh, became more important as natural resources, food and uh, energy, and even finance are uh, easily weaponized. Uh, information also works as an important weapon to manipulate the public opinion and uh, decision-making of sovereign states. The Japanese are concerned um, about the aggravation of the rules-based uh, international order and the war's impact on this part, uh, I mean, that part of the world. Um, let's take a look at uh, East Asian situations. Japan is located uh, in a very unique environment. It's surrounded by uh, three nuclear powers, namely Russia, China, and North Korea. Uh, uh, North Korea uh, has already nuclear weapons. Uh, it doesn't have any intentions to abandon nuclear capability. Um, you know, uh, all these uh, uh, three countries are authoritarian states. Russia uh, swayed uh, the very uh, basis of the uh, international order by invading Ukraine. And North Korea uh, supports uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, uh, for example, in the United Nations, and also uh, North Korea has delivered rockets and missiles to the Russian Wagner Group and further uh, fueling uh, Russia's aggression. And it also uh, launches uh, ballistic missiles, even uh, ICBMs like this. Uh, this is a picture released by the, uh, by the North Koreans uh, after uh, its, uh, their launch uh, on uh, in uh, February, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, China collides with uh, Russia, and they threaten Japan by jointly maneuvering uh, in the vicinity of Japan. Uh, you are now seeing the pictures uh, released by the Japanese Defense Forces uh, last year. They are jointly uh, maneuvering uh, uh, in the vicinity of Japan. And, also, China's military buildup uh, is very rapid. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, th uh, these are some gr uh, graphs uh, in the Japanese uh, defense white paper. Uh, not, uh, not only uh, Chinese PLA, but also China Coast Guard uh, have uh, their own problems uh, uh, toward us. Um, you know, China Coast Guard uh, has uh, military missions too. And uh, China uh, Coast Guard ships uh, regularly uh, sail 
uh, in the continuous zone around uh, the Japanese Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. And, and this uh, uh, you know, uh, blue uh, line shows how many uh, Coast Guard ships uh, entered into the contiguous zone uh, around the Senkaku Island. And also uh, red bars show how many uh, ships uh, monthly uh, and, uh, intruded into the uh, territorial waters around uh, Senkaku Island. It's quite reg they are quite uh, coming very regularly. And also uh, the Chinese uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, ships uh, uh, intimidate Southeast Asians uh, in the South China Sea. This is a picture in the uh, Strait Times the other day. And this ship, uh, China Coast Guard ship, uh, is uh, you know 4,400 uh, ton class and the CCG ships uh, uh, end, uh, which uh, you know, sails around the Senkaku Island sometimes are bigger than this one. This is a you know a, as I said uh, 4,400 4, ton class, but the uh, some of the uh, ships uh, around the Senkaku Islands are uh, more than 500, uh, 5,000. So it's much much uh, you know, a little bit bigger than. Uh, this one. Anyway, the, if you see the contrast between the Indonesian naval ship and China Coast Guard ship, uh, we don't know which are the uh, naval ships. Um, um, uh, they are intimidating Southeast Asians like this. Um, in addition, uh, because of the geographical uh, proximity between Japan and Taiwan, and uh, also because of the strong bilateral partnership between uh, them, I mean between Taiwan and Japan, uh, Japanese concern about the possibility of uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan is growing. Um, according to uh, uh, you know, Japanese opinion poll conducted one month after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 77% uh, of the Japanese were concerned about the possibility that the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine would affect the situation over Taiwan. Uh, this is an opinion poll conducted by Nikkei. And according to uh, another poll, uh, I mean, uh, conducted by TV Asahi, um, uh, actually almost the same time, 79% of the Japanese uh, believed that Japan's own national security uh, was threatened by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, according to the opinion poll conducted by the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, uh, <coughs> 88% uh, of the Japanese thought that East Asian uh, security became more acute. And this is the backdrop uh, against which the new uh, strategy documents were uh, shaped. A threat perception expressed in the new strategy is much different from uh, that in, in its predecessor of uh, 2013. Uh, actually, uh, when the Japanese government under the uh, Abe, uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Abe, was shaping uh, the, uh, the first ever national security strategy, uh, I was in the position of the Director General of the uh, Defense Policy Bureau in the Ministry of uh, Defense, and I was in charge of the uh, coordination of uh, that strategy uh, as uh, the representative of the Ministry of uh, Defense. Uh, since uh, uh, you know, uh, more than nine years uh, you know, uh, uh, have passed since then, and uh, the world situation uh, changed a lot. Anyway, uh, the, uh, nine, uh, the 2013 version of the uh, strategy uh, touched upon uh, North Korea in advance of China. Uh, so the order, uh, uh, North Korea first and then China, this order is opposite in the 2022 version. Uh, that, uh, that, and also, the 2013 version of the Japanese national security strategy did not have a uh, Russia section in its uh, you know, threat perception pages. Uh, shift of the uh, perception on China uh, is clear. Uh, uh, as you see, in 2013, uh, China uh, was an issue of concern, but in 2022, uh, China is regarded as an, uh, uh, an unprecedented and greatest strategic challenge. And shift uh, of perception on Russia is also clear. Uh, as I said, uh, Russia was not uh, in the pages of uh, threat perception, but uh, in another place, Russia was a 
a security partner in 2013. Of course, uh, there was a, a lot of controversy about that uh, in the, within the Japanese government at that time. But anyway, this, uh, uh, this was the uh, recognition in 2013. Uh, but now Russian uh, activities are of strong concern uh, uh, because of the obvious reason. And Japan's view uh, on North Korea also changed. Uh, North Korea poses an even more uh, grave and imminent threat to Japan's national security than ever, particularly due to uh, its frequent missile launches last year, and also uh, improvement of missile capabilities witnessed uh, in its uh, recent launches. It is no longer a regional threat, but a global threat because of its um, uh, ICBM capability. Uh, Japan is uh, threatened not only by these neighbors, but also by such global challenges as uh, climate change and pandemics, as uh, we already uh, discussed somewhat in the previous session. Uh, international cooperation is uh, indispensable to tackle them, but due to the lack of strong uh, leadership in the global governance structure and also due to the uh, intensified uh, rivalry uh, of great powers, uh, international cooperation has uh, become difficult, as uh, re clearly written in the new strategy. Uh, actually, the success of uh, counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia for the past uh, several years clearly shows the uh, importance of unity of international community. You know, uh, China joined it, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, India joined it, and Russia joined it, and uh, almost 30 countries, in, and also you know, EU and NATO participated in that operation. And all, uh, today, uh, the uh, piracy, annual piracy incident over there is almost zero. Um, when I was working on that issue, you know, 15 or uh, 15 years ago or so, you know, the annual uh, incident was uh, more than 200. So remarkable reduction because of the unity of effort in the international community. But it is hard to spread the positive effect of such effort uh, to other fields and areas today. In terms of climate change, um, competition will grow to acquire uh, uh, and process minerals and resources used in key technologies to produce renewable energy. Uh, China is in a strong position as it controls more than half of the global uh, processing uh, capacity for many of uh, these materials, including polysilicon for solar panels. Uh, the new national security strategy states, I quote, today we are in an era uh, where confrontation and cooperation are uh, intri intricately intertwined in international relations, unquote. It is right. Um, uh, international cooperation is must, but it is hard, uh, easier said than done. Now, uh, the strategy is not a revolution, uh, but a evolution. Uh, the famous uh, seeding of uh, 1% of GDP for uh, defense, sp uh, defense spending is actually gone long, long time ago, not last year. The whole of government approach was already in the strategy of 2013 uh, as well. The new uh, counter-strike capability, actually it's a very famous new capability, uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, it is basically extension of incumbent uh, capability. The change is about the speed and the amount of the Japanese effort. Uh, by the way, uh, what is strategy? Um, it's made of uh, three points. Actually, you know, many people say you know, ends, ways, and means. Of course, that uh, definition is right, but my definition is like this. Uh, it is made of three points, uh, assessment of where you are right now, and second, destination of uh, where you are uh, headed for, and third, uh, how you can de uh, get there from you are now. Uh, so the destination is very generic and uh, remain the same, for example, national security, I'm sorry, national sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, safety of the nationals, prosperity, and free and open international order, and so on and so on. However, we are in a very, very different uh, world today. So our path to the, des the same destination is much different from that in the past. The road is tougher and bumpier. Uh, meanwhile, Japan has more tools than before Japan's new strategy straightforwardly uh, emphasizes uh, that national security can't be achieved uh, without uh, whole of uh, nation efforts. Uh, it enumerates um, yeah. um, 
uh, diplomatic, military, economic, technological, and uh, intelligence capability as main element of comprehensive national power and establishes the ways to integrate these five capabilities uh, to achieve uh, the security objectives. The new se uh, security uh, strategy promotes the whole of government approach much more broadly uh, than the previous strategy. Uh, economic uh, economic uh, security is uh, its typical example. Economy in our societies is uh, basically uh, based on uh, commercial decisions, but that decision, those decisions will have considerable impact on our security. So, uh, supply chain of uh, natural uh, resources, energy and food must be resilient and uh, critical technologies must be uh, protected against authoritarian states, and critical infrastructure uh, must not be controlled by them. Uh, among the uh, remarkable changes in policies, a major increase uh, of uh, uh, Japan's defense expenditure. And Japan commits to increase the level of the defense budget to 2% of uh, the uh, uh, current GDP in fiscal 2027, uh, including some other complementary initiatives, even by raising tax. The priority of the new strategy is clearly shown in the budget for uh, fiscal 2023, uh, which begins on uh, April 1st, uh, very soon. Uh, the budget, uh, defense budget for uh, fiscal 2023 uh, 2000, uh, is increasing. Uh, uh, actually, it depends on uh, uh, the calculation, but uh, usually it is said that 27.4%. Uh, uh, in contrast, in contrast, only 1.5, I'm sorry, 1.7% increase for uh, social security, and only 0.5% increase uh, for education, and only 0.2% increase in uh, overseas economic cooperation. Allocation of uh, the defense budget is uh, noteworthy in this context. Expenditure for the um, equip, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. uh, equipment uh, maintenance um, is 80%, uh, uh, 80% uh, higher than that of uh, for fiscal 2022. Uh, if you see the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the left hand side of this page, and the expenditure for uh, munition uh, for fiscal 2023 uh, is 3.3 uh, uh, times as much as that of uh, last year. I mean, uh, okay. And the expenditure for facilities, facilities construction uh, is uh, also 3.3 uh, times as much. And operationally, operational capability of the defense forces will be much, much improved, I think. Uh, research and development budget, uh, research and development budget, yes, uh, is going to be uh, 3.1 uh, times as uh, much. So investment for the future is thus remarkable. And Finally, uh, there are a number of challenges uh, uh, for Japan. Uh, oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, Japan has to make its alliance relationship with the United States more robust. Japan hosts uh, more than 50,000 50, US troops on its own soil. Uh, Japan has been providing uh, one of the uh, most dependable uh, stationing environment uh, for the uh, US forces, not only by financial means, but also by uh, Japanese industrial uh, capabilities and capacities. As Japan expands its uh, military roles and enhances its capabilities, a new division of, of labor uh, will have to be devised. Uh, as somewhat uh, no, uh, already noted in the uh, joint statement of the uh, very recent joint statement of the uh, so-called 2 plus 2 uh, ministerial meeting in January, and then uh, in the uh, joint leader's statement uh, two days uh, later between the two countries. And the second, uh, in order to achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, FOIP, FOIP, international security cooperation with like-minded countries, uh, such as Australia, India, uh, ASEAN countries, South Korea, NATO members, EU, uh, is important. Uh, maritime security of the South China Sea uh, will be a focal point uh, uh, because, uh, because of various reasons. Uh, actually, in my mind, the, the importance of the South China Sea uh, couldn't be uh, overstated. Uh, 
Um, you know, the, uh, the, South China, South, the South China Sea is the artery of the world uh, maritime trade, and also uh, it is uh, just in the middle of the entire Indo-Pacific. And finally, I'd like to touch upon some uncertainty about the implementation of uh, the new strategy. As a declaratory policy, uh, the new, uh, new strategy has a lot of good points, uh, in my view. Uh, the Japanese public uh, seems to have a positive view on it, as uh, already uh, Professor Nakanishi said uh, in his uh, remarks in the previous session. But it will take a considerable amount of time and resource uh, to establish such a robust structure. Uh, implementation is challenging, I think. Uh, public support for tax increase seems weak. Um, deployment of new capabilities uh, might cause some strong opposition among local communities. Uh, it is not certain if other relevant organizations, such as the Japan Coast Guard, uh, will be uh, more cooperative uh, to make Japanese and American military operations uh, smooth and effective. Uh, actually, I don't want to be too skeptical about those kind of things, but uh, I'm just uh, cautious. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has raised uh, the Japanese concerns about their uh, security, but it, is, it remains an open question whether their willingness to do more in security terms will continue uh, for long. So uh, it's a challenging job for the Japanese government uh, to maintain the current momentum. Well, uh, as time is very much limited, I stop uh, here, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tokchi san. <laughs> Professor Calder. Um, let me first of all uh, outline a few things and maybe draw attention to some aspects of Tokchi san's presentation that I thought are particularly important. I, I've known him for many years, as I think many of us have, and he's one of the really the very most astute and, and um, profound commentators, I think, on Japanese security policy and, of course, knows the details so well also. So first of all, I'd like to say a bit to comment on directly as it's in our minds and it's fresh, but then also to move beyond that to try to link the discussion that we just had uh, previously, David and Allison and, of course, Nakanish-san and all of those presentations we heard to Japan itself, because I think all too often the discussion of Japan is sort of off in a, a world all by itself and isn't linked to uh, the broader transformation of Eurasia, uh, which is going on and, of course, intensified greatly by the Ukraine war and so on. I think in that regard, we really need to reflect on how it is that we happened to be here. I was talking to a couple of participants in advance. They said from Japan, they were saying, well, we've been coming to Europe recently quite a bit, and we are used to didn't, didn't do that at all. And so I think it's worth our while reflecting not only on what Tokushi-san says, but on how it relates to the international order, some of what da David was saying, or right? Allison was talking about new institutions and new architectures. And of course, one major dimension, I, I hope, I think, is of our being here is really to think about, you know, what some of those th things are, how we're moving into a new world uh, of new configurations. And of course, Japan likely will be in a sense, despite, of course, whatever the economy might have uh, declined and so on, but uh, the, the security role could very well be, especially across the continent in relations with NATO and so on, moving to a much more important uh, era that I think, so this compartmentalism, compartmentalization of the analysis of Japan I think we need to uh, move to overcome that. But first let me, and perhaps in my comments on Tokushi-san's presentation, you'll see what I mean. Uh, the, because the elements that really stuck, struck me were, he, he said, we've got more tools than before. 
the economic and technological dimensions, a whole of government approach that integrates the economic with the uh, political military, well, particularly defense industry. We just have a new arrangement, for example, Britain and Japan on fighter, uh, and, and Canadian. Italy, I'm sorry, Italy, yes, and Italy as well. Being here in Italy, pardon me on that point. So, I mean, that's one example of this. Um, he talked about dually, the new, new Use Institute and a tripling of uh, defense-related technology expenditures under the new budget. He talked about supply chains, critical technologies, the, you know, working as a, as a, as a global or a, a community to move away from Chinese control over rare uh, metals and so on of various kinds. They quietly, of course, gain tremendous capabilities in refining, even in areas where they don't have the basic underlying resources. Um, for, you know, so those are just, the, to me, that is the, the point. The point is not so much the expansion of the, the things that get the attention in the media, for example, 2% of Japan's moving from 1% to 2% of GNP in defense spending. Well, first that, in some sense, well, as Tokchi-san has said, it's kind of, there's been thing, a lot of things happening, but in a way it's overstated because there's some, I think David pointed this out too, there, there's um, a redefinition of the defense budget including you know pensions and so on and things that previously weren't included but for domestic reasons japan had tended to stress to downplay its commitments and now with the new international situation it's stressing the reverse and so there's a little smoke and mirrors in some of the figures uh, that we have seen which i think affirms the point that he made that this is more more evolutionary than not i guess i would say the one thing, maybe I don't know if I differ, I defer to his, him as the real specialist, but the counter-strike capabilities that were announced, including the purchase of uh, you know, a significant number of American uh, Tomahawk missiles. Um, there's been support for counter-strike capabilities building in Japan for some of time, as a lot of you no, I remember at the Fuji Dialogue just a few months ago that I was involved in, Minister Onodera formerly was stressing that point strongly. So it's been in the works, but that, of course, was capabilities that Japan has forsworn for a long time. Uh, to me, at least, might be something uh, that's a little more than just incremental. But broadly, I agree almost totally, well, that's presumptuous because he's the real specialist. But let me step back for a minute and have us reflect on the broader changes that are going on uh, across the continent and what Japan's relationship to those is. Um, of course, we had the collapse of the we had the collapse of the Soviet Union, then we had Georgia, and now, of course, we've got uh, the Ukraine. So, um, a fundamental change in Russia's role. But the collapse of the Soviet Union and China's Belt and Road, and more infrastructure, and then the ties, particularly between Germany and China, that evolved uh, during uh, Merkel, Chancellor Merkel's tenure, 13 trips to China, for example, I think began to develop some rather deep uh, relationships across the continent, the 16 plus one that then became 15 plus one, you know, uh, the, the, under the Cameron government, uh, Britain, and, and then almost all the European nations joining the AIIB the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. There's some really fundamental changes that have occurred in the last uh, decade or so and between China and uh, Europe, including the, of course, European Union. And then there are, in, within the Union, places like, um, say, the Hungarians, some of them are the same suspects, um, or others who that are the Western Balkans, like uh, Serbia 
that have uh, quite close ties with China. Some of them have the potential to play sort of veto player roles in terms of a deepening response to China. But of course, the com both the community and um, many of the key players have moved in new directions recently with China. But again, it's a mixed, I think, as an outsider looking at it, somewhat of a mixed picture in terms of Europe's uh, response, which I think then begins to bring one to Japan and to the Ukraine war and to polit domestic politics in Japan and what has changed, what is changing and what isn't. Um, I think the, in the Ukraine war, of course, well, be, before that, it was, it's really the, the rise of China in Europe, which has been a great concern uh, to Japan that I think others, uh, maybe even the United States, hasn't really understood the, the magnitude of all of that. But um, balancing from a broad G7 point of view, the ability of Japan to balance the ability of Japan to contribute more actively. A lot of this has been latent, of course, for a long time. Japan's the third largest economy in the world. And it has tremendous ability to invest overseas. It's very sophisticated in technological terms, including a lot of the dual-use technologies. Um, and so there's a lot that was latent. So that relates to what Tokuchi Song was saying, too. It was the export controls, it was the political resistance within Japan to deepening security, you know, more explicit security relationships. But to my mind, of course, Prime Minister Abe um, uh, advanced uh, these relationships. He established the deeper relations with, with NATO uh, earlier on, before. But, a lot has been catalyzed. In a way, it's remarkable at exactly the time from a broad G7 point of view. It was important for to have Japan in a more active role balancing China and, and uh, uh, inhibiting some of the advances of China across the continent as a whole. That, um, the, you know, we get the Ukraine war. And it's also, in a sense, it's fortuitous that the response to the Ukraine war in Japan is by Prime Minister Kishida, rather, who, you know, his faction, of course, the Kochikai within Japan has been the trade rather than security line. It's been strikingly different for, you know, across the last half century from the approach of the Prime Minister Abe's uh, faction. Um, and so I at least see, in a way, the Kishida government has been able to do, and, and there's some residual opposition in Japan toward a headlong movement toward remilitarization and so on. So the Kishida government comes along at a time of a Ukraine crisis that allows Japan in terms of the domestic politics of this within Japan to move more actively than I think Prime Minister Abe would have been able to even. He would have had the impulse to do so because he believed strongly, had a strong strategic sense. But whether he could have done so as rapidly uh, politically, I think might be another question, particularly on the question of relations with Russia because he, of course, he explored relations very intensively and was trying to get the Northern Territories back and working hard on that. But then, you know, he, it would have been hard for him to have turned on Putin in the way that Japan, I mean, the assets that Japan froze, for example, at the beginning of the Ukraine war were larger than any other country. And so, uh, some of the things Japan did were really quite substantive and also quite, uh, uh, in a sense, aggressive politically. And a new prime minister was able to do uh, some of those things. So I think we are in a very interesting new world in which Japan is linked to these 
questions of fundamental transformation in Eurasian geopolitics. We're, we're finally getting a Eurasian geopolitics across the continent, which we hadn't. The relation, you know, Prime Minister Keshida and uh, President Yoon both, of course, participated in the Madrid-NATO uh, summit. Uh, Japan has, you know, it's been more on energy efficiency and mobile transistors and sort of the economic side of security, really. But on some of these things, their support for Ukraine has been quite significant. And going forward, I guess, I would say that is the area, uh, the dual-use technology area, the energy-related area, and in terms possibly also of new institutions. What relationship, how is Japan or Korea uh, who, both of which, of course, have begun to reconcile under the Yoon administration and the Kishi administration. What kind of relationship would they have to NATO or to and more softer kinds of NGO-centric uh, or subnational uh, co collaboration or corporate collaboration, as we saw in the defense, the trilateral fighter agreement? I think we're moving into that sort of a new era. And that, to me, is the really interesting part of what Tokushi Sanda had to say. Great. Um, thanks for being concise also. Thank you both for two thorough, very interesting presentations. Um, we've covered a lot of ground already, uh, both on the analysis of the specific NSS and putting the doc document into the Japanese context with Tokuchi-san, but also integrating this Japanese change into the broader context uh, with Professor Calder. So, so thank you for that. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions by the audience, both online and um, in the room. But in the meantime, while you are all thinking about comments and questions to the panelists, um, I'd like to, to throw some questions at both of you so we can get the conversation started and we can delve a little deeper into the discussion. So, um, first of all, I think for a casual observer of Japan, um, it might be surprising that there has been no public outcry by the domestic public when the new documents were announced, as we've seen that in the past, uh, every time there is talk about a tiny change in defense or security policy, there is um, very vocal opposition, there have been demonstrations as well, and um, Nakanishi Sensei also mentioned this, even the political opposition doesn't seem to be against these changes, um, but it's questioning more, um, it's f focused on questioning how Japan will reach those ambitious goals. So I think the reality is that the Japanese public has become uh, gradually fluent in security issues over the past decade or so. Um, and I think many in Japan now believe that uh, these changes are unavoidable. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine was certainly shocking to the Japanese public, as mentioned here. And um, of course, I think the event has had a big impact on why a majority of the Japanese public supports these changes. And Tokushi-san, you showed some of the polls. Um, I know it's hard to assess exactly, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the connection between this initial support by the Japanese population and Prime Minister Kishida's leadership and political image. Uh, is it possible that these changes in the security strategy were also more acceptable for the Japanese public because they come from a not so hawkish um, um, prime minister like Kishida who has campaigned on his commitment to nuclear disarmament coming from Hiroshima and uh, he was seen as much softer than, than Abe for example. So in other words, do you think the Japanese public um, has a little more trust in someone like Kishida than, than Abe? Um, while you think about this, um, I'd like to throw my second question. Um, I'd like to discuss the first neighbor that the document mentioned, that the NSS mentions, that causes most concern to Japan, China. So the, the new strategy definitely, definitely talks um, so much more about China and in more concerned wording um, than its first iteration in 2013, 10 years ago. Um, Japan has been alarmed by frequent Chinese incursions and other military provocations. 
Of course, the Hong Kong piece was also uh, played a big role. Um, and um, I think Japan is worried that China might want to completely subvert the post-war international order that um, worked so well for Japan. Um, however, there's also the problem of economic entanglement with, with China. Um, and this is something that Professor Calder mentioned. Uh, it, it represented both um, growth opportunities for Japan, but also it, it's starting to really expose vulnerabilities in the relationship. And um, in fact, major businesses in Japan have spoken against the decoupling um, from China, uh, which could hurt Japan's uh, economic growth and trade and investments. So how should Tokyo balance these two aspects of its relationship with China? And maybe I'll throw in an extra question on climate change, cooperation with China, um, if at all possible. I know it's very difficult, but are there any areas of overlap that uh, Japan can work with China on climate change. Um, I will, um, I, yeah, I will add two more questions actually, and then we can, um, you can pick and choose and then we will open the floor to the audience. Um, the new uh, NSS also indicates South Korea as a like-minded partner in the FOIP vision, it's free and open in the Pacific vision. And President Yoon's reaction to the new Japanese documents were, was overall was positive, although Seoul did uh, protest about the piece about the Takeshima Dogdo Islands, of course. But overall, it was positive. And um, so the security cooperation between um, the US and Japan, so the US-Japan alliance is, of course, at the front and center of, of Japan's defense policy, but what kind of role um, do you envision for Japan's partnerships, and especially South Korea? And finally, um, one thing that um, the three identified threats, so China, North Korea, and Russia, have in common are human rights violations. Um, so if you were to advise the, the Japanese government, and that's maybe more for Tokushi-san, how would you recommend that Japan polish its image vis-a-vis -vis this um, becoming a, uh, an advocate for, for, for stronger uh, human rights? So thank you. There's a lot, but uh, hopefully one of, one of you can start. Yeah. Talk to Sam. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Sayuri Sam, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, peppering me with uh, those uh, interesting and important questions. Well, uh, in response to your uh, first question about the, uh, you know, the Japanese public view about the uh, Japanese national security, um, I think that, well, um, I'm not so sure how um, prime ministers Prime Minister Kishida's leadership was uh, contributing to the shaping of uh, the, uh, you know, uh, bold decisions in the uh, national security strategy. I'm not so sure about it, but definitely the um, the uh, aggravation of uh, the uh, security environment surrounding Japan, uh, you know, influenced the Japanese mindset. Um, you know, particularly the uh, the the saying that uh, Ukraine today is uh, Taiwan tomorrow. This phrase is. Uh, was becoming uh, popular and popular in the Japanese, uh, 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 of course, somewhat in influenced by the uh, you know Taiwan people. But uh, anyway, uh, that was uh, that saying was very much uh, you know popular among the Japanese people. And in fact, the uh, Taiwan is very uh, geographically close to you know Japan, only 110 kilometer uh, from uh, Taiwan to. Uh, a Japanese and island called uh, Yonaguni. So if uh, there occurs a Taiwan contingency, 
then definitely uh, it will affect uh, the Japanese territorial integrity. And also uh, China, PRC, uh, uh, claims that uh, uh, you know, Senkak Islands belong to uh, China. So therefore, uh, in various reasons, uh, the, the Japanese were more concerned about uh, the Chinese uh, intentions and increasing capabilities. So it's very, very natural for the Japanese uh, uh, to change their mindset. That's my impression. Um, uh, secondly, of course, you know, the Japanese uh, economy and Chinese economy are, uh, you know, intertwined with each other. And uh, I do not think that so-called decoupling is uh, possible. Um, you know, China's economy is integrated into uh, the world economy. And uh, so the, uh, the Japanese, uh, of course, the Japanese strategic position is very clear, alliance with the United States. Therefore, Japan is in the US side. Uh, in the context of the U.S.-China rivalry. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, China and Japan can't uh, you know, coexist with each other in economic terms. So the point is that Japanese, particularly the business community, uh, should uh, you know, get in touch with uh, China very, very cautiously. That's why uh, economic uh, security legislation was made uh, last year. And thirdly, uh, climate change issue. Uh, as I said in the uh, pre previous session, uh, there are some measures uh, in order to address climate change. Um, you know, adaptation, reduction, uh, adaptation, response, and uh, adaptation, response, and reduction. I do not necessarily think that China and Japan can cooperate in uh, reduction of greenhouse gas. Uh, uh, you know, uh, emission. But uh, I, I uh, do not rule out the possibility uh, that Japan and China will be able to cooperate in response, some part of the uh, response to uh, the uh, negative effects of uh, climate change, particularly uh, HADR, uh, uh, somewhere in, uh, for example, in uh, Southeast Asia or uh, some other parts of the world. Uh, I think that's uh, almost one of the, uh, the only possibility for uh, you know, cooperation in uh, so-called climate security between China and Japan. And uh, fourth, oh yes, uh, the, re uh, the relationship between South Korea and Japan. That's very important. If you see the uh, national security strategy of 2013, particularly the part of international security cooperation, the, uh, of course, the, the first the priority is the you know, alliance cooperation with the United States, but the secondly, South Korea, and then Australia, and then uh, Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN, and then and India and NATO countries and blah, blah, blah. But uh, in 2018, when, uh, I mean, uh, five years ago, when the Japanese government uh, renewed its own uh, national defense uh, policy without revising the national security strategy, the, the priority uh, was changed. Uh, uh, you know, US, Australia, India, Southeast Asia, and then South Korea. Uh, India, I'm sorry and uh, South Korea down. And if you see uh, the uh, most recent national security strategy, I think, if I remember correctly, still the, uh, the priority of South Korea is uh, as low as the previous one. So um, uh, it reflects uh, the uh, very cautious view uh, of, uh, on the part of the Japanese side on the, uh, uh, the South Korean willingness to cooperate with us because uh, we have, I mean, not myself, but uh, we, the Japanese, have you know, so-called Korea fatigue because they are always, you know, uh, moving their goalposts, so-called. Uh, but uh, of course, I uh, personally welcome uh, the new decision by the UN uh, government. But still, you know, uh, many people in Japan uh, doubt uh, how long it will continue uh, in 
2017, and I'm sorry, uh, 27, uh, four years uh, to go. Uh, in four years, there will be a, uh, you know, presidential election again, and uh, uh, assembly uh, election, when will, when will it be? Uh, next year? Well, anyway, uh, uh, close up uh, than to 2027. So uh, the, uh, I, I'm not so sure uh, the President Yoon and his gov uh, administration will uh, counter uh, the domestic opposition uh, about the new settlement. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, cautiously optimistic about that, but definitely, you know, Japan and South Korea are the only two countries in Northeast Asia uh, which support the robust presence of the U.S. Uh, armed forces. Uh, Japan hosts uh, more than 50,000 uh, U.S. troops, and South Korea uh, hosts uh, around 33 uh, thousand. Uh, in total, uh, almost 90,000 U.S. troops together. And uh, we have, I mean, South Korea and Japan has, have, you know, uh, common threats, North Korea particularly. So uh, we have many reasons to uh, cooperate with each other. And um, finally, um, well, a human rights issue. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, uh, I can't uh, afford any uh, qualification to uh, answer that question, but uh, I think that that the uh, the uh, you know as long as Japan um, treasures the continuity and uh, resilience of the rules-based liberal international order in order to uh, have uh, its own security and prosperity in the coming years. Um, Japan should, uh, you know, uh, put uh, much more importance to the promotion of uh, human rights uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, that, that's my uh, no, initial comment about that. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I can w see all the hands and, and all the flags up, so I won't t take too long. Um, well, first of all, on point number one, uh, Sayur, you asked a really in interesting question. Are the new changes more acceptable coming from a softer politician? And I think there is something to, there's a, it's a yes and no situation. First of all, of course, budgets and uh, actual policy implementation is a matter of underlying political strength, not simply atmospherics. At the level of atmospherics and the sort of initial floating of things, I think there's something to that. Um, an example, um, the it, uh, proposal to take defense budget to 2%. That was coming from a committee chaired by uh, former ambassador uh, Keiichiro Sasai, who is also head of the Kokomonka and Japan Institute for International Affairs. I, uh, he was also the chief negotiator on six-party talks. He's never been a, a real hawk. Uh, so that's just one example of what I'm saying. You, you can broaden a consensus group if you include some doves in a hawkish proposal or at least vetting it and getting it out. So in that sense, I think it's true that things are more acceptable coming from a softer uh, politician, or at least the softer politician has a network that allows them to recruit uh, a broader sort of consensus. But the budget is the question. There, I guess my thinking coincides a bit with the implication of Tokuchi-san. How far uh, ultimately will th these things go? Any of these proposals, um, if they face tax increases, there's talk of, for example, re-taking funds out of the support for the uh, uh, Tohoku, um, you know, money from relief for, for the Toku area and repositioning it to security. But of course that faces certain opposition as well. That's just one example. So, so there are limits. Um, on China, yes, I think it's true enough that business is against, a lot of business is against decoupling. 
you know, some of the large trading companies, for example, that have deep uh, relations with, with China. Um, so policy may well be ambivalent. Uh, Japan will be some parts, METI may be pushing for less, uh, you know, the decoupling. Um, climate change, I agree. Maybe the coordinated, the formally coordinated policies might be difficult, but parallel policies or implicit cooperation, I think that sort of thing you probably could see to some degree. Another area that wasn't discussed as a sort of a, a measure to dampen um, conflicts, I think in the healthcare area, looking, coming from John, Johns Hopkins, it's one that we've been looking at to some degree. And uh, you got things like cl clinical networks for future pandemics, the establishment there almost track two kinds of relationships. There's some areas, I think, in healthcare where um, China and Japan probably could do some cooperation on energy efficiency, you know, of course, there there's patent issues and so on. But I would say energy, um, and that the energy aspect of uh, climate change might be one of the easiest. And on Korea, um, I th exactly as Tokshi San says, the, I think this is crucial uh, for the future in strategic terms. The the ability of Japan and Korea to so not just strategically, more politic, politically as much as anything, but early warning, um, G the GSOMIA, the intelligence cooperation relating to, of course, North Korean launches and, you know, all of those kind of dangers there, qu quite serious potentially. And the ability to cooperate is, is important. Um, and yeah, I guess you've got to be guardedly optimistic. What happens after Yoon? And Yoon doesn't, the timeline comes precisely when things will get difficult with the Chinese. We haven't talked about the sort of proxy role of North Korea, uh, you know, or the, you know, its relationship to Taiwan contingencies and so on. They're, they're um, you know, and also the deepening partnership of Russia and China and what that means for Korea and, and then also the Northeast Asia as a whole. I think those are really uh, serious uh, potential issues. So a lot better, probably better short-term prospects for cooperation, I think, but ultimately a lot of serious challenges down the road too. All right, thank you so much. I think we have a long list and we have about 20, 25 minutes. All right, so please be concise, uh, state your affiliation. Um, so I think we have Axel first. Thank you. Very deeply, very deeply. I'm Axel Dacosta from the University of Italy in Italy. I'm sorry about, about being late. I, I live in Florence and I should have been the first in the room, but I was the last, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Um, uh, first of all, Tokuchi-san's um, um, sensei's pr uh, presentation, thanks a lot, great, um, very interesting. You, uh, you, you showed us the picture of, um, of, of Chinese intrusions, uh, Coast Guard intrusions into Japanese-controlled territorial toy waters in the East China Sea, you know, a couple of times this year, uh, and I th if I'm not mistaken, that's the first time this, this is happening, right? Uh, and uh, and the, quest the question is, uh, uh, is how, how, what does China have to do, in your, your view, for, maybe that's also a question for Professor Calder. Uh, what does Japan have to do, sorry, what does China have to do, or the J Chinese Coast could have to do for the U.S. to get on the case, you know, to, to apply Article, Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, protecting Japanese territorial integrity in the, in the East China Sea? You know, uh, what's, what's next, potentially? The second uh, question I have is to Professor Calder. You mentioned, um, you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the increase of, of the Japanese defense budget and for the first time that uh, you know, pensions are being included. I mean, that's, you know, that has been mentioned in the past, but now for the first time it is being included. And I think that's very interesting. And do you know, do you happen to know how big a portion that is of the new increase of the defense budget? Is that uh, significant or, you know, small? Yeah, so, Thank yeah, you. It's going down. Yeah, well,
It's a, I think it's a significant. It's a, it's a significant factor going forward. Of course, that's given more. Uh, we're, we finished with the wave of sort of wartime or early retirements and expenses, but now we're moving into another because the SDF is expanding. So I think it's potentially significant. Okay. Yeah. That's I, I think it's very important to uh, you know, put a figure also on, on, the, on the actual increase. Pretty good question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Get those figures. Great. Thanks. Um, Tokuchi san, would you like to respond to the? Chinese incursion and what does China have to do for U.S. to get on the case? Um, you know, the, the Chinese Coast Guard ships uh, uh, operate uh, within the continuous zone around the Senkaku Island almost every day, almost every day. Of course, they are not coming when the uh, sea is rough. And, uh, but uh, almost uh, every day these, uh, these days. And uh, sometimes, probably uh, uh, you know, once or twice a month, they are entering, I mean, intruding into the territorial waters. Particularly, uh, they are very much sensitive when the Japanese fishing boats are uh, uh, you know, entering the uh, territorial waters, or uh, scientific research ship of uh, the city of Ishigaki, uh, I mean the, uh, the city of Ishigaki uh, uh, controls uh, the, uh, that area geographically. So uh, the other day, uh, that city sent a you know, scientific research uh, ship uh, over there, and at that time, uh, the Ch Chinese uh, uh, ships uh, came over and intruded into it. And particularly, uh, the Chinese side uh, is very much sensitive when the uh, uh, Japanese fishing boats are with, uh, you know, Japanese right-wing political activists. That, uh, you know, uh, they are very much sensitive in those cases. But anyway, you know, they are regularly uh, intruding into the Japanese territory. And uh, that is a, of course, right now, the uh, Japan Coast Guard is uh, addressing those issues uh, very forcefully, I think. And uh, behind them is, of course, the U.S. Force Presence and Japanese uh, Maritime and Air Self-Defense Force. So, uh, so far, so, uh, so, so far, all right. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the Japanese, I mean, the, uh, already the Japanese uh, coast, Japan Coast Guard is outnumbered by China, uh, China Coast Guard, particularly in big ships. Mm -hmm. And although uh, the, uh, the Japanese side is trying to catch up, but still, you know, their base, I mean, Chinese base is much faster than ours. And uh, the, uh, as the Chinese intrusion, in uh, the Chinese operations uh, uh, in uh, those areas is not an armed attack against Japan. Therefore, nobody thinks that uh, it will uh, constitute assist the uh, this, uh, I mean, it will activate Article 5 of the Japan-US uh, Security Treaty. And uh, so um, it is uh, very much important to not to, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, not to uh, escalate uh, the tension by uh, increasing uh, Japanese law enforcement capability. And also uh, it is important to uh, establish a, uh, you know, uh, communication line between, uh, with the Chinese side. And of course, always, uh, you know, intelligence, uh, you know, cooperation with the United States. And that's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take uh, both questions by the, the hosts, uh, Julio and Endosa. So, Julio sure. first and then Endosa. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll try to be very brief. I think Axel was referring, and I'd be curious, uh, on intrusions by U.S. Uh, Chinese Navy ships in Yak uh, around Yakushima Island, uh, so territorial waters of, their, of, of um, <coughs> um, islands that are not disputed, uh, of territories that are not disputed. Uh, and I'd be interested and curious about, uh, about your assessment. But I have a broader question for both, but I guess uh, really for Dr. Ka Professor Calder. Um, we have seen the national security strategy of Japan and the three strategic documents coming really shortly thereafter the uh, parallel release of the U.S. equivalents. And we, re we, we see a lot of emphasis on integrated deterrence and the possibility also for uh, joint command uh, 
We see also a US footprint uh, in emphasis on asymmetric capabilities uh, uh, across the first island chain uh, with the marine brigades in Japan and the Philippines. We see the US also pushing uh, the defense policy of Taiwan. So my question is, uh, to what extent is Japan a proactive player? And uh, <laughs> to what extent is Japan a reactive player again? Or in fact, co-active player? <laughs> to what extent, this is also for Tokuchi Sensei, to what extent, in fact, it's, it's actively cooperating with the US and has an equal role in shaping uh, defense policy. Thank you. Right, uh, may I uh, ask two basic questions to Tokuchi Rijo? Uh, I just, um, uh, you know, they still a bit confused about the China's uh, um, intention and capability to, to invade Taiwan. Uh, the, uh, some of the uh, generals uh, of the U.S. Army says it's likely, and uh, you know, uh, around 2026 20, or something. <laughs> And some others say that Beijing doesn't have any intention or even you know, ability to invade Taiwan. The, um, you know, I just met uh, one of the uh, uh, top Japanese diplomats uh, you know, in charge of uh, China. It's a public event. Yeah, right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, yeah, he said that there's really nothing. And he's rather, you know, anti-communist party, but still, you know, militarily speaking, there's really nothing, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And then if I uh, also mention the analysis of uh, Kazuhisa Ogawa, uh, you know, in terms of shipping cap capabilities, China doesn't have any any ability to uh, ex execute the frontal invasion. So I just, just would like to ask uh, you the, your, your own assessment uh, uh, on this. And second, um, the, about this uh, national security strategy, um, uh, you emphasize rather sort of continuity, uh, sort of incremental changes than the rapture. Uh, uh, but the, if, if I may, I would like to ask about this uh, counter-attacking capabilities. Um, um, how would you situate this, uh, uh, the new agenda uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and capabilities on the part of Japan? And how, how would you uh, sort of uh, situate it uh, with the sort of uh, exclusively uh, defensive-oriented uh, policy that post-war Japan has, uh, uh, has up upheld? So that's my questions. Thank you. OK, I, I just got the message that we have a little more time. So, so no worries. <laughs> yes, please go ahead, Dr. Chisang. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Professor Pagli's uh, first question, actually, uh, I'm not so sure about it. But you know, the, uh, the first island chain it is usually said that, uh, uh, that China has eight exits to the Pacific Ocean. And probably the strait which you mentioned is one of them. And uh, I, I have, well, actually, I, I, I'm not uh, willing to say these, uh, make these comments uh, in front of the you know, experts like you know, uh, 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 Professor Maso, but uh, um, you know, the uh, the Chinese are trying to expand uh, 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 its own presence in the uh, Pacific, and in that uh, regard, uh, China is trying to say, uh, I'm not so sure, but I speculate that the, that strait is an uh, international strait in terms of the UNCLOS, therefore transit passage is possible. Uh, uh, that's a possibility. I, I'm not so sure about it, but uh, I think that's a, uh, one of the possibilities. And in, in terms of Taiwan issues, um, you know, the, of course, you know, China cannot deny the possibility of use force against Taiwan. But uh, it is, um, well, even if uh, Taiwan uh, invade uh, invades Taiwan, 
uh, it is very, very difficult for the Chinese to rule uh, Taiwan after the invasion. Uh, in 1975, when uh, you know, Henry Kissinger visited uh, Beijing uh, in order to meet with Mao Zedong, uh, he raised the question of Taiwan. And then at that time, uh, Chairman Mao said, wow, uh, we don't want uh, Taiwan for now, for 100 years. You know, it, it can be within the hand of the United States for 100 years, because there are so many you know, counter-revolutionaries uh, in Taiwan. Uh, that's what he said in uh, uh, you know, 1975, October 1975. Of course, the military capability of China is now m much, much, much bigger than uh, the you know, 50, 50 years ago, but uh, still, you know, uh, you know, there are so many counter-revolutionaries, so-called counter-revolutionaries in Taiwan. So uh, I think it is uh, very hard uh, for China to rule uh, uh, Taiwan. So we have to uh, think about it too. But uh, the, the balance of power uh, over the Taiwan Strait is tilting to the Taiwan, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the uh, continental side. Therefore, it is very, very important to retrieve uh, the balance of power uh, you know, on our side. And that's why you know, uh, those people who are very much worried about that possibility uh, tend to say that uh, the, uh, the war with, uh, of aggression from the Chinese side is coming uh, soon. But it all depends on how uh, we can make efforts, how much effort we can make to deter uh, China. Uh, yeah. And uh, finally, you know, counter-strike capability. Well, um, you know, the uh, counter-strike capabilities and uh, the capability to augment Japan's missile defense capability. So it is not uh, a capability for, uh, you know, such as, uh, you know, uh, deterrence by punishment. Uh, so, uh, 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 let's see. Uh, and also, uh, it is uh, very much important, probably critically important, for Japan to cooperate with the United States mm. in intelligence and technology mm. and uh, you know, targeting and operations. So it is not an independent capability. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, and also, you know, the uh, as far as the Japanese uh, long-time exclusively defense-oriented policy is concerned, it is not against it because uh, from the first, you know, since uh, uh, 1954 or so, the Japanese government kept saying that the, uh, having that kind of capability is not uh, prohibited by that policy. So uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think uh, the Japanese position is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Calder, any comments on the... Yeah. Just briefly. Um, uh, first, I would totally agree with what uh, uh, Tokshi-san said about counter-strike uh, capabilities. It, it, it the information and the coordination dimensions are going to be very important, which will f inhibit, would inhibit independent action. Um, and actually force a kind of, that relates also to the question about, you know, reactive, preact, proactive, co coactive capabilities. There, there's going to be a real dynamic in the U.S.-Japan relationship now, I think, with these new, the counter-strike capabilities toward a need for more coordination, intelligence coordination. Of course, there's discussion of what kind of a command structure ultimately is needed, the, the joint uh, the Japan side already has been consolidating its um, capabilities, and uh, there'll be the, the issue of U.S.-Japan coordination. What that form would take, of course, is in discussion right now. Um, now, on the broader question of the reactive state, I, of course, in, in world politics, it's been you know 30 years and more uh, since I did that piece, um, and. I think what you can say is certainly Japan's capabilities are getting more proactive. The Conte is larger and stronger and it more independent than it was. Um, there's a lot that's dependent on leadership. Prime Minister Abe spearheaded a lot of the more proactive uh, orientation. If Japan doesn't have, speaking to some of the issues talking about, 
proactive leadership going forward, how proactive could a, would a Conte be? There's that. Then there's the other broader question of the international system and its evolution. And I think the system is becoming, is forcing all nations, all major nations, to become more reactive than they were, despite their structural qualities. And of course, Japan's some degree of fragmentation, and even, you know, there's some resemblance to Italy, some interesting resemblances. Um, you know, I think fragmentation still is fairly pronounced, so I still would hold to the idea that uh, structurally there's some reactive bias, it's becoming less, but the United States, for that matter, is reactive. I take the Indo-Pacific concept, for example, that came from Japan originally. So, less reactive and a little more coactive, I guess. All right, thank you. I have Christian and then David. I'd like to take them together. Yeah, um, my name is Christian Wirth. I'm from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, and I have a question to mainly Professor Tokuchi, I guess. Um, reading the national security strategy after, admittedly, for some years not really following the Japanese politics very closely, what struck me was the, the sense of urgency and the sense of the need to prepare for war, including evacuation plans from Okinawa Prefecture. So that really brings me to the question, you know, how, what's the thinking in, in Tokyo about a possible war, whether that could be contained to Taiwan or to Okinawa Prefecture? And I also wonder whether you could elaborate a bit more on, on the delicate balance between deterrence and reassurance that is needed, uh, not only at the, at the current stage, but also in case um, there would be governmental change in, in Washington or in Beijing. And, um, or a change of mood in Beijing, and the leaders there might actually uh, do what some scholarship on, on the security dilemma has warned or, or outlined, namely that um, people get so anxious that, and, and so much lurking for certainty, they actually start the war in order to be certain that the war is happening now when they choose. Uh, I think that's a question that uh, some of the voices that we mentioned are, come, for instance, out of Washington, about the timeline of an uh, invasion of, of Taiwan really suggests that it's happening. So I just wonder whether you collaborate on that and possibly, if at all, if there's any role of Australian or European countries in either mitigating uh, or complicating a Japanese calculation on this question. David. Yeah, thank you both for very insightful presentations. Uh, is this the end of the Japan as a normal country debate, finally, after 30 years? And um, relatedly, is the air finally going out of the history issue after more than 75 years? And if so, what possibilities does this open up now for Japan? Thank you. Any reactions? Can I go first? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, um, you know, uh, in response to uh, Mr. Uh, Worth's uh, question about the sense of urgency of Japan, I think that, you know, those issues like, you know, munitions or facilities or maintenance cost and those kind of things, uh, those are quite, you know, overdue issue. You know, in the past, actually until very recently, the Japanese government, particularly the Ministry of Defense, was, uh, you know, just emphasizing the importance of frontal equipment like, you know, fighters or tanks or destroyers. Not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, prioritizing the operational capabilities or, you know, con uh, it's, um, uh, so, it's a kind of you know, overdue issue. So, um, and uh, the, uh, in terms of possible scenarios, of course, you know, the, uh, the, the Japanese side is uh, prioritizing the defense of the Southwest Island chain stretching from the south of Kyushu to the direction of Taiwan because that length is, the, the length of the, um, uh, the uh, Southwest Island chain is almost 2,000 kilometers 
the, uh, very sim uh, you know, similar to the length of the main island of Japan. But the, that's, that region, I mean the island region, is a kind of power vacuum. You know, of course, there are some you know, US forces in the main island of Okinawa, uh, but uh, no other places. And the, these are you know, just you know, island places, and so uh, the Japanese uh, defense forces are scattered around. So that region is very, um, you know, the uh, kind of power vacuum. So in order to deter China's expansion to the Pacific uh, you know, uh, Ocean, it, it, uh, has, um, Japan has to strengthen its own uh, defense capability. So in that sense, that's priority number one. And secondly, of course, you know, the uh, North Korea is a you know, dangerous neighbor, uh, becoming more dangerous. So we, uh, Japan has to you know, address North Korea as well, particularly you know, missiles, uh, you know, intermediate uh, uh, missiles. Uh, those are the two you know, uh, possible concerns among the Japanese side. And um, finally, uh, in response to Dr. Welch's question, you know, I'd like to say that, uh, of course, the, the Japanese uh, national security policy is uh, um, somewhat normalized. But still, I am afraid that the Japanese way of thinking is too legalistic. And I'm not so sure whether it is because of the Constitution or not. Uh, uh, it might be a matter of, you know, uh, culture of the Japanese. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But definitely, um, you know, there is an uh, issue about the constitution. And because of the constitution, the Japanese strategic mindset is still, you know, not mature. So the, uh, I think the next thing what the Japanese should do is the revision of the constitution. Hmm. A lot of really fascinating issues that people are raising. Um, maybe just briefly to, to those last uh, set of questions that David, you, you raised. Um, normalization. Well, um, I would agree with what Tokchi-san said, but to add a word or two about the abstraction of the security issues, even a little different. The, the geographical dimension, nobody mentioned, interestingly. The, in a way, did, of course, historically detached, Nakanish san was talking about that, and different conceptions of security. But, of course, Japan's a maritime nation. It is away from the continent. It is next to Taiwan. And so, the key uh, point there, I think, is maritime security. What, it's contingency driven. There's an awfully lot, I think, of the future evolution that will be contingency driven. You don't have a really strong military industrial complex or a strong set of interest groups, for example, emigre groups or something that in many places have driven security policy in a particular direction. It's a little more still sort of an abstraction, but contingencies with some looming contingencies, particularly directly next, China, Korea, and Taiwan, which I think are what will drive the whether Japan becomes a normal nation in terms of, or, or moves in a, in a different direction. And on the history question, well, I think we have to remember it's, you know, there's the wartime heritage there. And um, from the Japanese side, I think it probably is declining in centrality as an issue. Um, the question is, will it be stimulated elsewhere? It relates to the educational processes, of course. We're moving it beyond the generation. You know, there are not a lot of comfort women left, for example. How will these issues be transferred into the new generation? It'll depend, I think, on education and leadership. And um, th for now, it's between Japan and Korea, it's died down. But of course, China also has the ability to stimulate this because it was, its historical experience was somewhat similar to that of Korea. And it can possibly could uh, help to revive the issue again. 
All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, let's move on to the next batch um, of questions. Matteo and then Chen Hui. Uh, can you be fairly brief? Thank yes. you. So um, I had a question on Counter-Strike very briefly. Uh, you already said it ends up uh, stimulating more coordination with the United States. But my question was whether uh, certain moves that arrived to the national security strategy and the decision on Counter-Strike were actually reactions to the early Trump years. So looking for more resilience, more uh, autonomy from the United States, having a doubt on the long-term reliability of the US, especially what if Trump or something similar to Trump comes back. And another question was about the Japanese perception of the relationship between China and Russia. Because from the uh, value-based moral point of view, we tend to emphasize the commonalities between the two. But if we think strategically in a certain way, as uh, Prime Minister Abe did in a different moment in time, uh, it's better to emphasize the differences and to try to work out a strategy to wedge them, so to try to separate them in order to avoid this sort of strategic nightmare, for Japan especially, but for us as well, to have sort of a monolithic uh, opposing uh, alliance between China and Russia. So I would like to know uh, your take on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Chen Wei. OK, um, try to be very, very quick. Um, um, we try to uh, make an uh, energy between Iraq, um, Taiwan, and Ukraine, especially in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, I'm not sure whether it is the right energy um, between these two countries, if I may, um, especially from the US perspective. I don't think uh, US treat these two countries at the same, uh, in the same way. Um, and follow on this, I want to, um, we, at some point we talk about um, Shinkaku and also I mean, in China they call it Diao Yitai. Or in, tai in, in Taiwan we also call it, it Diao Yitai. <laughs> um, there's an energy, um, I think there can be some energy uh, uh, between Shinkaku Island and Taiwan to some degree. Um, I think US, uh, US Japan uh, defense treaty make it clear the territorial application extend to Senkaku Island, if I recall correctly, if I read the, uh, the news correctly. And my, and, but at the same time, uh, China uh, claim sovereignty on Senkaku Island. At the same time, China also claim sovereignty over Taiwan. But for the, in the case of Taiwan, uh, I guess if I read 100% uh, strict, uh, strictly from the legal text, US-Japan defense tr treaty does not extend to Taiwan. So my question is, uh, since uh, a lot of Jap uh, Japanese, they are concerned the future of Taiwan, whether or how the government try to prepare if they are under Japan, US defense treaty to, to um, send their, their self-defense uh, um, uh, self defense, uh, army, not army, to uh, Taiwan Strait when, when there's a Taiwan, uh, uh, when there's a uh, contingency there. And what will be the legal base? And my final point is, imagine, I mean, uh, uh, if China really want to attack Taiwan, the first strike would not be in Taiwan Island. Because uh, it is supposed, uh, this primary is uh, based on China. I'm is sorry, that the first strike would? Not, not, not be not, Taiwan. Okay. Because uh, the premise is uh, based on uh, Chinese assumption that US would 100% intervene. So if China wants to preempt this, then it should be Okinawa or somewhere instead of Taiwan. Um, you know, uh, actually, I can't uh, answer all of the, those questions, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, Mr. Dian's question about counter strike capability, um, the originally it was the idea uh, from late Prime Minister Abe when he 
uh, became prime minister in uh, 2012 again. So uh, it was not, it was before the Trump age. And uh, uh, the, in his mind, there might have been, uh, you know, the, his own, you know, uh, you know, willingness to be more independent from the United States. But um, at the same time, he fully understood the importance of the alliance relationship with the United States. And uh, I do not think at all that the Japanese government as an institution uh, took the position of uh, independence from the United States by acquiring counter-strike capability. Rather, the Japanese position is that because of the, um, you know, the increase of missile, ballistic missile capabilities and because of the uh, increase of missiles, and also they are, they have, they may have nuclear capabilities. Even one, de uh, even leak of one missile uh, may cause a huge damage. So therefore, it is almost impossible to depend on missile defense capability alone. Therefore, the mixture of defensive capability and offensive capability, that is necessary to make the security of Japan 100% sure. So, it, it has not, so now it has nothing to do with the uh, Japanese orientation to be, to want to be more you know, independent from the United States. Mm -hmm. Professor Calder, if you can consolidate yeah. the questions. Yes. Um, well, the only thing that I would really have to add to that is really sort of an, an open, and, and it's a rhetorical question, the relevance of North Korea contingencies to some of this. Um, not to question any of what Tok Chisung was saying, but, um, you know, it could be, that particular area is one where I suppose Counter-Strike probably would be relevant, and uh, the Trump administration was somewhat, uh, what should I say, inconsistent, at least, uh, in its policies relating to, to North Korea. Um, one other point. The, relating to our discussions of Taiwan, and again, I speak as not as a specialist, but just um, sort of as an interested observer, we talk about strikes and missiles and, and all of that dimension, and of course the counter-strike is in that area. Of course, we talked earlier about gray zones and blockades and the naval dimension, you know, or the sort of the gray type of uh, inter uh, complications. I think we certainly shouldn't, in thinking about Taiwan, ignore that variance of what we saw, say, after sec, um, Speaker Pelosi's visit, or, you know, of course, gray zone activities have been so important in the last several years. Tokshi san mentioned all the harassment of, you know, almost daily that's going on. You know, variants of those kind of things could be the most realistic scenarios relating to Taiwan. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to take the two, the last two questions very briefly. I'm so sorry, and thanks for your uh, patience, uh, Professor Masuo, and then Professor John. Well, I thought uh, I wouldn't have any chance in this session, so I'm very happy about this. Well, I, I wanted to be a little bit provocative uh, to uh, to Kuchisan. Um, I wonder uh, how many people are critical in those uh, three security documents within the Japanese government. I raised this question uh, because, um, uh, well, uh, 
in Japan, uh, people, uh, the security experts, uh, all say uh, this is a wonderful ex <laughs> document. Uh, fundamentally, uh, it, uh, those change, you know, uh, Japanese security strategy fundamentally, or something like this. But um, act, uh, as far as I know, uh, there are many uh, area studies specialists and also uh, many. Uh, uh, experts in diplomatic history all argue that those those are especially the security strategy, national security strategy is a very bad document because um, uh, well of course uh, as a China expert I, I understand it is very important to have um, the power to uh, contain China's some of uh, some of their uh, intentions and uh, activities. However, at the same time, now we are competing with China, Russia, and those countries because we are looking at the you know future uh, international order which is being formed right now. Uh, we compete because uh, we want to have you know a favorable uh, international order in future. But you know uh, this time. Uh, we know uh, that uh, by now, <laughs> uh, the uh, many uh, developed uh, developing countries like Global South, they all want to have you know bigger voice, bigger voices in their in the new, next international order, and uh, China understands it fully. And so uh, I think uh, well, many many Japanese experts, yeah, think it uh, too pro Western and uh, basically ignores the importance of those countries in the global uh, uh, order. So uh, I, I wonder if there are any uh, critical voice on this. Dr. Zhang, very briefly, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, two speakers. Um, I, I'm working uh, on perception and misperception theories in strategy and, uh, strategy and security studies. So my question might be a little bit theoretical. Um, uh, firstly, for the how to shape in perception is quite a difficult thing. Uh, in your previous remarks, I think you mentioned something, something happens in one place, could happen in another region. Or something happens in the past, could repeat. So I recall my, when I was in college, I read a, many books on analogies in international relations. For example, no more Munich, no more Bien Bien Phu anymore. So these analogies are very useful to persuade and convince the uh, spectacle, uh, both elites and uh, the public. But sometimes these kind of conveniently used analogy could be uh, quite uh, misleading intellectually because it simplifies a lot of complexities. And also, it could be, in terms of policy, could be disastrous as well. So we have, as intellectuals, I think we have to be very careful, use these analogies. So I would like to have uh, your take on this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Speakers, any final comments? Yes. Um, uh, Professor Masuo, thank you very much for your very uh, deep insight about that issue. Actually, I, um, you know, I, and I appreciate your comment about that. Um, as I am a former government official, uh, people tend to think that I'm fully supportive of the uh, recent development of the Japanese uh, national security strategy. But in, in fact, I'm not. Um, you know, I'm, uh, of course, you know, I would like to encourage the Japanese government to be more uh, you know, straightforward about the Japanese national security and defense and but, um, you know, I think, uh, I'm not so sure whether I took your point correctly, but uh, I think that your point is well, uh, you know, uh, uh, your point is very important because, you know, the, this time, the, uh, the, those three national security documents emphasize uh, the, um, you know, Japan's own, uh, you know, defense posture, particularly defense buildup. Of course, it is in very much important. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't uh, say many things about Japan's regional security. Um, uh, you know, the, the, for example, the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific region has so many diverse sub-regions, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Pacific Island Nation, Indian Ocean, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
but there are no, uh, you know, detailed uh, articulation about the how about how the Japanese government should implement its own free and open Indo-Pacific vision uh, in those uh, sub-regions. And uh, uh, so I think that uh, the, uh, I, I, uh, in retrospect, I think that the Japanese government should have uh, articulated uh, much more about uh, how to, uh, you know, the promote regional uh, security cooperation. And also, uh, as you said, you know, uh, the uh, regional uh, architecture building. There are so many, you know, uh, mini laterals and uh, smaller types of network, like, you know, US Centered Alliance Network or OCAS or Quad or those kind of things. So of course, Quad is not necessarily about, uh, uh, you know, mm. the security, but it, in, mm. in fact, it has some kind of, you know, security element as well. So mm -hmm. there are so many uh, small, uh, you know, uh, networks, but uh, it is very much important to network those smaller networks. So, so I think that the Japanese uh, government should have thought about that issue and that kind of thinking into this strategy. That's my comment. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Calder, you have 30 minutes, otherwise I will okay. be scolded. Yeah. Uh, seconds. Seconds. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I think yes, I... thank you. Of course, <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I think I'm, I can I'm do hungry. it more briefly than that. Um, <laughs> taking off on what Tokushi san just said, I think the you know the architecture coming we've talked a little about this. We have I hope we can talk more about the question of architecture and how Japan is going to be related to architecture and many lateralism. Certainly I think the Biden administration's quite uh, congenial. I mean, remember when Kurt was over at State, Kurt Campbell, he always was talking about triangular relationships and you know, now he's talking about the G7 and the G20 and, and APEC and how are they all going to relate. Minilateral, we're in, we're in a world where I think minilateralisms of various kinds or track 1.5 dialogues, um, regional cooperation, as Tukshi san says, in some new dimensions, for example, in the South Pacific, the Japan, the Australia, and the United States down in the, you know, the Solomons, just to cite one example, that kind of thing. We've got more of. But I think the, for me, what I take away from this uh, session really is that um, the Japan is relating in some new ways and will going forward, and we need to think creatively, or those who are really involved need to think creatively, and of course listen to other uh, groups in 1.5 or two, track two discussions about regional organization and various kinds of new arrangements that in, involve Japan. And if they're sort of creative new ones, it'll be easier to do that than say, well, how does Japan relate? Does it become a member of NATO or something like that? It's probably not. The organization that are going to develop. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for your flexibility. And with that, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you so much. Thank you.